So, no. so where are folks living if not in the, in the refugee camps? They live all over. Uh, as you know, um, you'll find people in, everywhere from villages, smallest villages. This is a family that was squatting in an abandoned farm building outside of Rehanli, which is uh, right on the border in Hatay province. Um, I just saw them there, stopped in, and ended up spending the afternoon with them. And um, this is the father. Um, he was trying to find work. He, the most he ever got was uh, some very part-time farm labor work, and otherwise he, they didn't get anything. So any food that they had, uh, they were getting from family, friends, neighbors. Um, little bits of money coming in here and there, and they were trying to make do with what they had. Yeah. So I wanted to start the book with the what at least people in the States see as a more traditional refugee picture. The camps, poor people, you know, eking out an existence like this, but the rest of the book is not necessarily like this, which I hope you'll see. They had been, actually, I forget the man's name, I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, he had been in prison before the war, had just been released, and as soon as he got out in the war started, he brought his family across, and they literally had nothing with them. In, the, in their case, uh, in, in the case of all the families in this village, there was a local coordination committee of, uh, made up of Syrians that got together and helped uh, each other. So if someone got something, they would share it, or if someone could arrange getting something from uh, an aid organization, they distributed it uh, with, to everyone that they could. Uh, they didn't get any help from anyone else, no outside NGOs, no, you know, no Turkish government, nothing. Okay, we have to, we have to pause this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this guy, uh, before the war, was a judge and a uh, religious teacher. He was sent to Pakistan and uh, other places to do de-radicalization programs, to basically teach young men, hey, you know, don't listen to Al-Qaeda. Right. So he's back, he's working as a judge in Derazar when Al-Qaeda moved in when Nusra moved in, and they tapped him to become a judge. And uh, he reluctantly took the position. He didn't particularly want to, but he you know, he was mostly rubber stamping oil deals and things like this. And one day, the, uh, the emir came up to him and said, come with me, and took him outside. And there were a group of eight people, men and women, lined up out there. And he shot him in the head and said, I need you to sign the execution papers. And he said, oh, I no, and the emir said, well, if you don't, I'm going to do the same to your family. And that day, he put his family in a car, and they went to, to uh, Turkey. And so he was in living with uh, the other people in the, those villages, and at first he didn't want his picture taken, but after a while, he ended up... Uh, he ended up agreeing. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to. And hopping on a, an old motorcycle. Like <laughs> so I, I like this picture because... Okay, he's in the same situation as the other people in the pictures that I just showed, which I feel are more traditional, what we call refugee, you know, sad refugee pictures. Um, this guy's in the same boat, but he's this. This is what I see when I'm hanging out with Syrians: it's people making the most of the situation, having a good time if they can, um, sharing food with each other. And this guy even is wearing a hat because he was trying to grow his hair back and made some sort of homemade hair growth potion and burned his scalp. <laughs> and his friends were making fun of him for it, so he had to put the hat on. You could take another photograph of him without the hat on? No, he wouldn't. <laughs> he didn't want that. Can you talk about this family? Um, this is kids from, um, Look, the kid in the bottom is from a different family. He's the one with the shoes on. The rest of them are um, sons of a guy who, it's that guy. Um, and he had broke, he had a job and he was working in a field and broke his leg so he couldn't work anymore. Uh, again, I went back to find them uh, a couple months after this and they were gone. Uh, again, I'm not sure what happens to some of these people, but they end up, as you know, moving on to either uh, a different city or a camp, or many people went on to the Balkan route, as you say. So, 
that speaks to how vulnerable a lot of these people are. Like, they don't, if they are working in the fields or in a factory or wherever they're working in Turkey and something happens to them, who's going to look out for them after that? Yeah, no one. No one. Uh, they're on they're, their own. They're on their own, but the, you know, I, I'm, I'm of Armenian descent, but uh, so my grandfather is from central Turkey, from, he left in 1915, but, um, what struck me going over there and spending so much time with uh, Syrians, but Arabs in general, is how much uh, community support that they have. And so this guy, yeah, he didn't, I, I say he didn't have support, he didn't have any official support, but I know that the, the reason I was there is because the local relief coordinator took me to see this family. Um, and so if they had something extra, they would have given it to them. To them. I speak English, I speak a little Arabic, um, not enough to do a, a real interview, and I speak a uh, little Spanish and French. When I work over here, I definitely I need an interpreter with me. Okay. Yeah. How do you approach people to take their photograph, then, if the, if the language is a difficulty? Uh... Um, I usually just walk up to them. Um, they can, I, I don't walk up and take pictures right away. You walk up and you start talking to them and find out what's happening with them yeah. first. Eventually, I'll ask to take a picture, uh, or they'll offer. Sometimes they don't, and I still do an interview with them or sit down with them. Um, I feel like it's important to not just go and take something. I think it's important to go and try to feel what they're feeling, try to uh, get a sense of what's going on with them. Um, and I think that emotional connection is important, and that's what I think gets you pictures that yeah. that are good. Would you say that's the difference between documentary? I know you consider yourself a, a documentary photographer. Is that a difference between documentary photography and more news? Yeah. Photography? So they the they overlap, of course, but um, I don't go to uh, an event, run in, snap a couple pictures because something's happening, and then go file them. Uh, I go and I, I try to spend as much time as I can with whether it's individual families or communities and see what's really happening there uh, and try to form a bond with people. And I end up staying in touch with a lot of the people that I that I work with. Um, and it's a sometimes it's good to do that and sometimes uh, it's painful to watch people that you have come to care about going through some difficult things. There's a whole section in the book of these uh, Polaroid portraits. And these are mostly shot in Gaziantep in southern Turkey. Gaziantep is the one of the largest cities in, in southern Turkey where there's a high concentration of, of Syrians, right? Yeah, I think, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I think that before the war, the population was somewhere around 1.5, 1.6 million. Wow. And in, one, in one city? Yeah, wow. and then I, I believe that after uh, Syrians started flowing in, it got up to about 2.2, 2.3 million, just in Gaziantep. And that probably includes the surrounding communities. Yeah. yeah. And were people generally okay with you taking their photograph? Did you have to, when they saw someone walking up with a camera, because this, the security situation in Gazing is a bit sensitive, isn't it? It can, it, it was at times. Uh, when I first started going down there, there was no, there were no restrictions. Uh, I didn't have much of a problem. Um, some of these are from Killis. Uh, in Killis, definitely, if you were walking around with a camera out, the police would stop you it, and you had to have a permit. And um, people were, sometimes they're not receptive. So no power in the house. Um, you know, I, I stayed there late, uh, multiple nights, and uh, we'd just sit around on, on, with candlelight. That's what they did in the evening. And this is where community comes in, because they would sit around as a family, or the neighbors would come over. Uh, they didn't have television or other you know, means of entertainment, and they sat and talked with each other. Is she a grandparent? She is. That is her grandson. Yeah, there were other adults, but the the father, I believe, at this point was out working. He had gotten a, a factory job, I think. Um, there were 
her and her husband, and again, I don't remember their names. Uh, they're in the uh, my notes in the caption for the book, but um, there were four families, all from the same family. So her, her and her husband's four children were living there, and they all had children of their own. And so there were about 24, 25 people living in, in basically two rooms. He had to hide being gay when he was in Syria. Um, he was almost found out by Nusra and because he was wearing a necklace um, and escaped, and he had to hide from his family. But he did get asylum in Germany and was able to bring his sister. His sister, of course, knew. But did he try to? Did he try to live? Did he try to work or exist in, in Turkey before taking the decision to to leave and go to Europe? He actually had a good job. He worked for a radio station. Um, I can't. It, Smart. smart. Yeah. Oh, how was smart? Yeah. Opposition. Yeah. Radio station. Yeah. And uh, he was a radio announcer. Um, you know, I'm, he wasn't making you know a long-term sustainable living, but he was getting by well enough. Um, and he really enjoyed that job. I think he would have stayed if, in particular, in his case, um, being a gay man was very difficult for him in, in, within his community. He had to hide it. This is a guy named Arif, uh, and he speaks very good English. He works for uh, um, an English language NGO, and he's a Syrian guy, young guy, has a daughter, nice apartment. Um, and I, I wanted to show people in a way that maybe people in the United States could relate to. Um, this guy's no different than someone of his own age. She's, she's talking to her... Uh her coworker or boss or something. In that in, she couldn't even speak at that point. She was just babbling, imitating her dad. <laughs> and I know my nephew did that too. Syrian war has undoubtedly been good for journalists. I know a lot of people who've made their careers out of this visceral and horrible and strangely beautiful um, conflict and country. Honestly, have journalists been good for Syria? Have they? Have they made people even think that things were going to happen that didn't happen? Have they possibly encouraged people to have a strategy where there would be victims because they thought journalists would cover it and then they would publicize the message and things would get, uh, would change? There would be interventions of some sort that, that just haven't materialized. I know lots of people who've made their name in this war, but, but they haven't affected much change for, for Syrians. I mean, it's a, it's a, Good question. It's a valid question, and you know, has has have the stories that we've told from Syria had an effect? I'm I'm pretty cynical about it. I don't think that that uh, anything that that some of us have done has really made a difference. Um, with that said, I don't know what policy wise could have been done different. I've talked to people the United States State Department that claim that they have all these plans and programs and, and everything and I don't know. Um, I don't know what the, you know, I, I, geopolitically, I don't know what we could have done differently. As journalists, uh, were we good for Syria? But yeah, overall I would say that the people that I know were telling accurate stories. Um, you know, the uh, you know, yeah, I don't have a, a clean answer for you about that, Darius. <laughs>